As Saloni mentioned, we have in store another power pack session for our audience today. Uh, let me invite our panel members for a discussion on the future of AI. Starting with uh, Masayuki Toriumi san, who is the managing director at Sony India Software Center Private Limited. He has more than 30 years of career in IS IT organization at Sony, including over 10 years of overseas experience, including India. Welcome and uh, thank you, Toriumi san, for joining us today. I would request you to switch on your video and uh, join us. Our next guest and panel member is Dr. Hiro Aki. Konokaji san, also known as Dr. Hiro san, he is a general manager at Tokugawa Product Headquarters, a part of Tokugawa Electric Corporation. Dr. Hiro san has been with Tokugawa since 2007. He is currently pursuing the development, application, and commercialization of AI design for production sites. Previously, he was engaged in machine learning application R&D at Microsoft Japan. He holds a PhD from the University of Tokyo. Tokyo. Welcome and thank you, Dr. Hiro san, for joining us today. I request you to please switch on the video and join us in this panel discussion. Our third guest is David Kurnapu san, who is a senior engineering manager in AI and search at Mercury Japan. Uh, David san heads the search engineering organization at Mercury Japan, a leading C2C marketplace. He has over 15 years of experience in scientific computing and machine learning domains, including recommendation, deep learning, based in writing recognition. Uh, David also has a keen interest in open source technologies and was a full, former core contributor to NAM and Skippy. Uh, thank you, David, Sam, for joining us today. Uh, our last guest for today's panel discussion is Ajay Kapekul who is an experienced researcher at Ericsson Research. Ajay has been focusing on innovating in machine learning, machine reasoning, and multi-agent reinforcement learning to help include, improve quality of service and experience in 5G and 6G. Welcome, Ajay, and thank you for joining us today. Now let us hear more from our experts. And my first question is to Urimi San, uh, Nisan, we know that deploying AI is one part of the picture. However, a lot goes behind the scenes where a unified data architecture is needed to get the right outcome. What are the sectors, according to you, that enterprises should focus on to prepare themselves for a smooth deployment of AI? I hope uh, I've been audible to you in case. You yeah, yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Mohit. And uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Torimi, the head of the NSIC Sony India Software Center. And uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Dinovan team, for giving me uh, such a wonderful opportunity to share my view. And uh, I hope you know that helped you know all the audiences, some of, some of the audiences. Number two, and uh, I, I'm not you know that uh, engineer, so I'm not a techie guy. So I'm just a person who loves beyond the wine here in the Bangalore. So, so please don't ask me that any technical question, but instead uh, I want to share uh, my view uh, from the management perspective, how you know, the AI should be implemented and how AI will help and support you know, the, our you know, business organization. There is, and uh, answering to the you know, first question, the Mohit, and, uh, the, and to me the AI is just a part of the big picture. What I meant by big picture is, you know, the maybe the, you know, the uh, AI covers, I would say, the back end uh, for analysis, whatever. But you need certain front end, you know, who provide data transaction uh, to be fed to the you know, back end. I call it the front end. But you have tons of different channel of the front end. Let's say that maybe the hardware, maybe smartphone, the TV, or the, maybe the uh, the you know, chips, you know, the uh, sensors, maybe you know, the enterprise application provides data, or maybe you can get some data from the SNS. So there are tons of different you know, the channels. And uh, of course, you know, the, uh, that part, the front end should be data right. So what data right devices or you know, input or front end should be used to leverage AI, you know, the uh, performance, you know, that pretty much, you know, the importance. So uh, to me, the, you know, the uh, front end, data realization, and the back end, kind of the intelligence. So both, you know, the uh, data realization and the 
uh, intelligence need to be, uh, how say, uh, come up with a certain the, uh, architecture in the big picture. So you have to come up with, you, know, the, you have to always think about the big picture. Don't just focus on the AI part, you know, that's my point. Uh, thank you, Toriyo san for sharing this. Uh, I have a follow-up question here for you. Uh, you touched upon the backend and the front-end here. According to you, how can enterprises choose the right business models to operationalize artificial intelligence? Would you have any perspective on this as well for our audience? Uh, excuse me, Mohit, again? Uh, my question to you is, how can enterprises choose the right business models to operationalize artificial intelligence? Would you have any perspective for our audience as well? On this yeah, I mean, you know, they, of course, you know, the uh, AI is not perfect. So we have to pick up the right or appropriate business model, operation model, whatever. So the same thing, you know, the AI need to be grown, right? In, in, in front, kid, you know, the um, high school student, other, whatever. So you start with the easy one. A good example is maybe you know, the sales, you know, sales forecasting. You know, they, they have a tons of different type of you know, the product model. Some product has very stable through the year, holding a battery. That's a good example. But on the other hand, some model has a seasonal hike for Christmas market, the holiday, holiday sales, whatever. That part in AI might not be you know, good at you know, the handling. Those you know the exceptional cases, exceptional hike at the beginning. Of course, you know, maybe the, if the AI grown, that they, that can be handled that kind of hike. But that, that so you have, you have to pick up the right model to start with. You know that's my point. Thank you for sharing that, and it's an interesting perspective to start with an easier model, uh, which is easier for the enterprises to implement. I think that's a great advice. Uh, this is your experience. Uh, uh, thank you, Toriyo uh, san for sharing this. Hiro-san, my next question is to you. Uh, okay, please. AI is perceived synonymous to automation, and we are seeing enterprises inclining towards autonomous systems for production, inventory management, and warehouses. Uh, this is also known as dark factories or dark warehouses. In fact, recently, Uber conducted a pilot test for autonomously running a chemical plant for 35 days. I have two questions here for you. My first question is, do you see this trend continuing? And second question, which I have for you is, can you also shed some light on the role of AI in scaling autonomous systems? Okay. And uh, okay. Uh, well, first of all, uh, hello, everyone. And uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, on this very uh, Good session. Okay, then let me answer. Uh, and uh, well, yes, actually, we Yokogawa succeeded in uh, AI plant control for um, 35 days. Actually, it's a very disruptive innovation. And uh, actually, we did uh, press conferences in uh, Japan and India, so you can find some articles uh, on the web uh, by searching, uh, you know, uh, Yokogawa plant AI control or something like that. Okay, but this autonomous AI uh, is not for dark plant, uh, which means uh, uh, maybe no one is working on plant or something like that. But uh, this AI is for um, improving the efficiency uh, of uh, manufacturing, actually. Okay, uh, let me uh, explain briefly what we did. Um, the customer's plant was fine. Everything was working uh, well. Uh, with automation technology, that's good. But uh, one complicated uh, factor uh, jumped into the site, that the sustainability. So the customer wanted to uh, something uh, for sustainability, uh, well, uh, say uh, uh, energy saving or something. So they wanted to use waste heat uh, in addition to the normal boiler, normal electricity, okay? but. Uh, problem is the waste heat is very unstable. So uh, the quality of uh, final product would be out of range uh, if we use 100% waste energy, okay, waste heat. So, uh, so the controlling the waste heat for sustainability and uh, uh, normal boiler for normal, you know, uh, uh, 
energy uh, is very difficult thing actually so they did many things uh, they applied the legacy uh, methods uh, to control the very difficult trade offs but uh, they could not uh, do well so we applied the ai the latest technology which yokogawa uh, invented and uh, uh, it succeeded actually um, okay then before that well a professional human was interrupted several times an hour for example uh, to check the uh, trade off controlling the trade off uh, well uh, the valves are were manually um, operated before ai was adopted that was a very frustration right uh, i assume you have professional of some job but uh, you are interrupted several times an hour Okay, uh, then, uh, uh, right? So after we applying AI, you know, um, the professional worker there uh, can do, can concentrate on, their, on his job. Uh, that's a very uh, good uh, improvement of efficiency, right? Okay, so let me answer your question. Uh, do you see, uh, yeah, um, the trend? Yes, I think so. There are many complicated factors in the plant industry. Uh, one of them is sustainability, of course. The other one is globalization or uh, supply chain or something like that. So AI's role is uh, getting a, a more and more important uh, to, to control such a very complicated trade-off, which cannot be solved by the legacy theory or legacy method. Okay, and uh, uh, so uh, AI can um, do more uh, to solve such a complicated problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Viva San, for uh, sharing your perspective and what you could all have I have a follow up question here. I have to touch upon sustainability being a larger mm -hmm. My question to you is that many enterprises, especially in the energy and the manufacturing sector, are pledging mm -hmm. to cut down on their emissions and are opting for sustainable operations. According to you, how can AI be leveraged here to meet the sustainability goals that enterprises are setting up? Yeah, actually, uh, AI can contribute such a, a new problems uh, yeah, uh, in the plant industry, actually. Well, the most important AI would be a reinforcement learning. Uh, a bit technical, but the, uh, re reinforcement learning needs just a target, for, for example, um, CO2 emission target or something like that. Then such a reinforcement AI uh, learns how to control along the such KPI. And uh, actually, uh, that's what we used for the uh, AI control in the field test. Okay. Interesting. Uh, thank you, Hiro san, for sharing this. Uh, David, I will move to you, and uh, I have a question here for you. Uh, AI, we all understand it's a necessary tool that enterprises are leveraging today to differentiate themselves. Could you let us know, in terms of how Mercury has been creating a differentiating experience for its consumers, leveraging AI? Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mohit, and thank you for having me uh, here. Um, so yeah, like uh, as you for your question, so you know, basically Mercari is the leading C2C marketplace in Japan. And one of our, our mission actually is to make sure to create a marketplace where everybody can buy and sell items. So what does it mean in terms of AI? Well, in one aspect, we are kind of like most e-commerce you know, companies, like very first one, famous one like Amazon, Rakuten in Japan. And in from that perspective, we just use data, machine learning, statistics, and AI in areas that have proven their values since the early days of, you know, uh, like um, like the internet, commercial internet at least, you know, for at least 20 years plus. So like recommendation, marketing optimization, et cetera. Like, so those one are the one you would expect. Uh, but one difference we have because we are a C2C marketplace where anyone can be a buyer, but also a seller, uh, we want to make it very easy for anyone to sell the items, which means we make it easy um, for people to just create new things to sell on the marketplace with just a bit of information and images. 
And so it's basically like unstructured data. And this is where I think there is some interesting challenges with AI in the context of C2C is because we have to somehow extract information from this unstructured data to match buyers and sellers. And this is more difficult than traditional e-commerce. Because if you think, let's say, you know, Amazon, right? Of course, in practice, it's more complicated, but to make it simple, they have a catalog of information. They will know the product uh, names, they will know the SKUs, they will know the colors, the weight, all of this kind of information in a database, right? In a structured setup. But we don't have that, right? People may give this information in the information, but it's just unstructured text. And so this is where like AI can really, I think, use, because it's been really powerful, especially you know, with deep learning, is to use uh, semi-structure or even like completely unstructured data, typically images. So to give you a bit more concrete example, one of the first successful use of AI at Mercury was more than five years ago for a system called Kendo, where we use deep learning and computer vision to automatically fill some of the information from the picture alone. So you're on your cell phone, you take a picture of the item you want to sell, and um, you know, instead of having to enter everything by hand, uh, the AI can help you putting some information like title, description, category, and stuff like that. We also use like NLP, so natural language processing, to filter relevant information, to help surfacing the most appropriate item to customers. We have some personalization aspect as well, which is something you would expect. And so in that sense, I think Mercury is actually typical of one of the key trends in AI, which is what I call sometimes like boring AI. Like a lot of people think AI is like super cool. I think AI is cool too. But people tend to overly think about the cool aspect of AI and the things you've seen in the news. But I think actually most of the value you can leverage in AI uh, in the future is on things that are less obvious, less cool, less magic, and kind of almost invisible to the end users. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, like this is one of the most interesting aspects of how we use AI at Melkali and in general. Uh, thank you, David, for sharing that. And I also read about you, like you also have a keen interest uh, in open source. And we are also seeing a rising trend towards open sourcing of AI models. My, I have two questions here. First of all, do you see this trend continuing in the future? Second, how do you believe, uh, believe that enterprises can benefit from open sourcing of AI models? Okay, so let me answer this question in only two parts. So uh, first, I think, you know, I guess I'm a bit biased, but uh, I think open source has been definitely one of the key to the recent AI advances, especially deep learning uh, in particular. Like I strongly believe that the ability for researchers and practitioners to start sharing code, use each other code to reproduce model, especially was one of the key to the deep learning revolution that has happened in the last 10, 12 years. Because before, like actually when I was doing my PhD myself, uh, we were already using machine learning, or data, et cetera, but a lot of the code was not open source because it was difficult to do, or it was not, you know, there was no GitHub, and you know, nothing like that, or sometimes it was hard to reproduce, and everybody had to work from first principles, so everybody had to relearn the same lessons over and over and over. And I think, you know, the fact that Deep learning appeared after open source became very powerful trend in software. I don't think it's a complete coincidence. And if you think about some of the key tools for deep learning, like Ciano, which is one of the original one, Keras, Torch, PyTorch, etc., all of those tools are open source. Um, and that enabled people to focus a bit more on their domain, on the problems they have to solve, instead of having to recreate everything from scratch. So that's for the open source of the code, but that's not enough. And so like part of what you see a bit more recently is open sourcing like models. And I think we need to be a bit careful about what is meant uh, by open source AI models. Because just having the models that means the code is actually not enough. Because you need to know which data were used to train and to create the model. And in general, you need to know how the data were created. And in some domains, it's not possible, right? It can be hard for like legal reason, or it can be hard for ethical reason, etc. And so often, you know, you you I think where like the open sourcing of model will have the most impact depends a bit on the domain, 
one domain where it's obviously already working and I think it's going to be more and more impactful is on the NLP side with those very large models. The biggest model like GPT-3, et cetera, are not open source, but people like, for example, Hugging Face is a famous example where they have now like thousands of open source models on their website uh, for NLP, for various tasks and various languages. And I think it will really help democratizing uh, the use of AI against like this boring AI in the sense that people can use AI without being an expert in AI and to apply it to their own domains that they care about. Uh, so that I think is definitely a trend that will will continue. Um, but I don't think it will work for every domain because of, partially because of the issue I mentioned before. Interesting. And I have definitely picked up your term on boring AI. Thank you David, uh, for educating us on this. Uh, Ajay, we'll do you. And uh, as uh, David mentioned, that if there are different sectors and verticals, and so we also touched upon that. My question to you is that uh, what we are observing, telecom to be one of the verticals that is picking the pace in the AI days, and they're investing heavily uh, in artificial intelligence. How uh, is AI transforming telecom into it, starting from the design phase to its implementation? Would you be able to share your perspective on this? Yeah. Um, Firstly, thank you uh, to Zeno for uh, inviting me uh, to this panel. And I'll be talking about uh, some of the telecom aspects from Ericsson's perspective. So Ericsson deals with many of the mobile network operators throughout the world. And what we are seeing is that there is transformation happening in multiple countries from 4G to 5G. So in 4G, the concentration was more on media, video and data, while in 5G, you would have uh, much more flavors of uh, deployment where you would have to uh, handle, say, uh, robotic data, um, data from autonomous vehicles, XR, VR, so on and so forth. So in order to handle this process, uh, one um, a key strategy which is being used is network slicing, where you are able to slice this network and provide end-to-end uh, -end guarantees, for starting from the uh, user to the radio base station to the transport network to the core network and the cloud network. You are able to subdivide your resources in an efficient manner in order to meet the various QoS requirements. And to handle the slices would have uh, multiple phases in the life cycle. Uh, you have to deploy your site or your radio dots at specific locations in order to have enough signal strength. Uh, you have to vary the power based on the traffic patterns which you see for particular devices. You have to allocate resources at the edge and cloud in an effective manner. So uh, in, in all these cases, you have AI systems inbuilt which are tracking the uh, number of users who are in the system, whether they are uh, having uh, enough quality of experience, what are the changes to be made um, in a dynamic manner. And because of the large complexity of these systems, they cannot be handled in a, a human form. You need to have AI inbuilt to uh, which we call zero touch or cognitive networks. And uh, these networks are able to self adapt and self reconfigure. So they change, they can change the power level, they can change the antenna angle and tilt, they can migrate virtual machines from the cloud to the edge, for instance, if the latency requirement is um, being violated, so on and so forth. So for all these models, uh, AI needs to be incorporated in uh, an effective manner. And uh, what we see is that uh, things such as reinforcement learning, planning, all these are uh, important tools to uh, leverage and uh, take into account so that uh, communication service providers and mobile operators can handle the complexity of 5G in an uh, effective manner. And we've been talking to customers who are uh, deploying these in enterprise applications. So I'd like to talk about two applications. One is in manufacturing, where we are seeing uh, movement from um, your traditional robots to more cobots and digital twin uh, kind of environments where you would have a digital twin of the entire factory floor and that requires a lot of data to be uh, uh, updated. So uh, companies such as NVIDIA, ABB, Bosch are already having digital twins of the factory floor of their robotic operations of the people who are uh, working on the factory floors and they can monitor and optimize the end-to-end -end system. So, 
this requires uh, 5G and 5G plus data sets and optimization and AI is needed for traffic prediction, uh, positioning, localization uh, in built in these models. And in future, you are going to also have a uh, lot of XR and um, uh, VR devices. So with metaverse and other um, kind of equipment coming in where you would have uh, more Im immersive type of communication, 3D communication. So the kind of traffic patterns requirement, QoS requirements for these are going to change. And so for this end-to-end uh, -end system, starting from planning, deployment, fulfillment, assurance of the 5G or 6G systems, we would require um, AI to be inbuilt uh, to plan the system, to continuously monitor, to have uh, knowledge graph and uh, being learned and auto in, in an automated fashion uh, reconfigured. And so in, we see that uh, AI is going to be uh, sort of inbuilt into both uh, 5G applications as well as uh, the actual management of 5G networks going forward. Thank you, Ajay, for sharing the perspective on uh, AR, VR, the Mixa, and 5G and 6G. On that note, I will definitely circle back to you because you follow the question. Uh, but for now, let me uh, move to Irosan. Irosan, uh, I have a question here for you. Like developing AI models is one task. But scaling AI is another challenge altogether, especially when enterprises are looking out for ways to scale and deploy AI with faster time to market. This is where we are seeing the shifting preference of enterprises towards pre-built applications. Do you think that in the future, pre-built applications will be a good solution for enterprises to deploy AI? Secondly, Will this be dependent on the type of applications or workloads that enterprises are building? Uh, you know, I hope the question was audible to you. Let me know if you want me to repeat it. Okay. Uh, so for the first question, um, yes, uh, pre-built uh, application uh, will uh, be more and more popular, I think in uh, plant world and uh, but the, on the other hand one more big wave will run at the same time that's a very uh, not an instant uh, application but uh, a kind of a heavy uh, um, application of ai uh, as i said you know uh, like uh, ai control of sustainability issue and uh, uh, the quality trade-off or something like that um, uh, because you know, uh, pre-built application is a uh, will make uh, you know uh, the plant workers' lives easier. Yes, uh, but uh, uh, there are some unsolved problems uh, in plants. Actually, you know, a plant has a very long story of study uh, in uh, for for decades. I think many academic persons. Uh, made a formula or mathematics or anything, okay, uh, and solve the problems as far. So uh, the problems remaining in the current plant is very, very difficult, uh, yeah, from such a long history uh, viewpoint. So for such a complicated problem, maybe uh, uh, they need a customized uh, AI, uh, which will uh, make uh, something beyond human's uh, b brain or uh, human's mathematical uh, power or something. Um, so maybe my question is, uh, there will be two ways. One is pre-built application, of course, but uh, the other one is uh, um, some AI, beyond AI, uh, beyond the human being um, in the plants. Yeah, it, it is a B2B market, not B2C. Okay. So, uh, sorry, what was the second question? <laughs> sorry. Uh, sure. My second question is, do you think this will be dependent on the type of applications or mm -hmm. workloads that enterprises mm -hmm. are particular? Well, yes. Uh, as I said, you know, uh, uh, types of application uh, choose the kind of AI, right? I think, yeah. Uh, some can be realized by uh, a bit the instant AI, but the uh, the other uh, would need a more, more and more um, complicated uh, AI, I think. 
Thank you, Vira Sahib, for sharing this. Sorry, uh, Vira my next question is to you. Uh, even after implementing artificial intelligence, in some cases, we observe that personal judgment triumphs over AI-based decision making. And we see that human judgment is driving the outcomes even today. According to you, how can enterprises address this mindset gap? Yeah, so, okay. thank you for asking. You know, the, that is one of the biggest thing you know, I have to address, I have to highlight here today. So the, because as I mentioned, the, you know, the uh, AI is not perfect, but some people believe AI is perfect, right? So the, as they mentioned. So the biggest challenge is you know, the, how much humor will be involved in that process. Then more humor involved, more confusion or more problem will come. So that's you know, kind of the, I, I would say that that's a reality. A good example is uh, sales forecasting, demand forecasting. So the, you know, some people believe still, I'm the best. I'm the best, you know, the planner, whatever. That's a typical, you know, that's a typical thing what is happening in a company, right? But on the other hand, if AI provides a different answer, then some confusion is there, so which we, we believe, right? So that's the biggest challenge, you know. So the from that perspective, you know, the I have to maybe I have to say that uh, we have a two tracks. Number one, visible to visible. Number two, invisible to visible. What that meant by is, you know, the invisible to visible is very important and uh, easier one. So for example, the maintenance, pre pro, uh, pre preventive maintenance, you don't know. What happened? What is going on? I mean, what is going on until something happens? So that part invisible. But AI definitely can help. IoT and AI, I would say, definitely will help to make it visible before something happens. That's a good. Then the visible to visible is you know answer. For example, sales folks is a good example. You know, maybe April, uh, maybe the May sales will be in the 10,000. But AI says, of course, AI can help you to make it visible. But if AI provides a different answer, no, no, no. Uh, this case, May sales is uh, 8,000, 8, whatever. But there's a huge, huge, there's a gap. Then what's going to do? So, so visible to visible, you know answer. It's easy for you to compare human decision, human being decision, and AI decision. But on the other hand, more trouble, more <laughs> confusion will be happening. But on the other hand, invisible to visible, right? Because you don't know answer. AI tells us, you know, the easy for us to apply that process or scheme or that the solution to that process. So I'm not saying which is good or bad. At that totally depending on the, you know, the culture of your organization, culture of your, you know, the company. But um, I have to say, we have to pick, we have to have a, you, know, the, you have to have a two different tracks, you know, visible to visible or invisible to visible. Then you, you, you have a, you know, the, uh, how to say, uh, good idea, a good, good view on which, which part, which track should be applied to which part of the organization in your, organ, in your company. So that's you know, the kind of the, how to say, I want to highlight here. So. Um, thank you, Gauri san for sharing, this, especially the visible to visible and this is invisible to visible theory. I think this is quite interesting. Uh, moving on, uh, Ajay, to you, I have two follow two questions here, Ajay, for you. And uh, touching upon what you talked about, AR, VR, XR, and 5G, 5G. So my first question is, we believe that AI acts as a convergence point for different technologies like the IoT, AR, VR, big data, and 5G is enabling value generating use cases for enterprises. Could you elaborate on certain trends or use cases that will be enabled by integration of AI and 5G and 6G in the future? Uh, so, as I said uh, before, um, so in 5G, you would not only have your uh, uh, traditional data and uh, voice traffic, you would also have requirements for 
uh, other devices such as robotics, uh, IoT devices, XR, AR, VR. And so you, we, we, are, we are able to subdivide the entire network into multiple slices, which we call, and then provide the requirements for, say, ultra-reliable, low-latency communication or massive machine-to-machine -machine communication. And then you also are going to have public and private networks. So public networks are those that are deployed um, uh, online, while private networks are for specific enterprises where we are able to maintain the traffic patterns, so on and so forth for uh, those uh, specific uh, enterprises. So uh, going forward, we see that there are going to be four or five key challenges uh, in this space for which you would have to take into account uh, AI into multiple aspects. So one thing is that you are going to have accelerated automation and digitalization. So uh, in many of the fields, both uh, um, in enterprise domain, as well as uh, in our day-to-day -day life, you're going to have uh, integration of robotics, drones, um, um, automated uh, uh, robotic applications. And in, in these cases, you uh, require data sets to be sent for training uh, the, uh, the devices, uh, the agents which run on top of that. You need uh, uh, communication capacity to upload IoT sensor devices, and you need to have a closed loop control automation loop so that there is no not too much latency in between uh, uh, the robot detecting a particular object or um, uh, there are some changes in the environment and that needs to be interpreted and you're going to have automated actions to that. You're also going to have limitless connectivity, uh, at least going forward. Whenever you require additional bandwidth or you require um, uh, requirements for a particular device, then the network should be able to provide this dynamically without you having to uh, have manual interventions. So this is what we call as cognitive or zero touch network. So both 5G and 6G systems are going to have uh, these things into process. And um, uh, that would allow us to have seamless connectivity and uh, between different parts. You also need to have trustworthiness into these systems because we're going to in involve the decision making bias can creep in you might have fairness issues you're not sure whether the ai algorithm is uh, having regulatory constraints so on and so forth so how do you uh, implement that integrate all that into the life cycle those are critical factors and uh, ai needs to have these um, factors into account and because you're going to have so much compute communication um, device requirements energy is going to be a key factor so sustainability and many of our customers are also talking about uh, how to make networks more sustainable ai can help there as well by uh, uh, looking at when to charge particular base stations or uh, radio base stations or um, uh, servers with uh, solar powered or wind powered um, uh, div um, uh, energy sources rather than making use of conventional energy sources, when to put some of the devices to sleep when you don't have enough traffic. So a lot of these uh, algorithms can be incorporated and you could have uh, learning loops on top of that to uh, look at uh, daily patterns or seasonal patterns and see uh, how to further optimize the network in order to make it more sustainable and automated. So these are all some of the cases where uh, 5G and 6G networks will integrate with many of these applications and where AI would be inbuilt for trustworthiness, automation, sustainability, and connectivity. Thank you, Ajay, and I think you have already also answered my next question, which was uh, to understand the role of AI in the enablement of end-to-end life cycle management. Uh, thank you for explaining this and if this is for our audience. Uh, David, I have, uh, moving to you, I have one question for you, uh, which I believe is also close to your heart. Uh, from a very conventional rule-based model, to neural networks and transformer-based models. We are seeing the nature of AI algorithms getting evolved on a regular basis. We are also seeing emergence of algorithms that minimizes reliance on 
large training data sets. In fact, uh, in future, less is going to become more. So according to you, where do you see AI heading in the future? Yeah, so I think um, for most people who follow AI, like the current trends are fairly clear and I expect them to continue. Um, the first one is the continuation of what some people call like the unreasonable effectiveness of computation. And what I mean by that is that we're going to have bigger and bigger models and bigger means like more parameters learned, more data used, more generic, etc. Um, like a famous like article around this is uh, from uh, Rich Sutton, who is one of the founder of modern computational reinforcement learning. Uh, he called this like the bitter lesson. That is, he said the biggest lesson from the last 70 years of AI research is that in general, the methods that can leverage computation are ultimately the most effective and by a large margin. But leverage computation doesn't mean like, you know, folks were like using GPU, et cetera, like having much more, like much more parallelism, um, much more, raw compute power, that's only part of it. The other part of it is also just how to leverage that computation better. And, you know, like through more data, but also like through like more clever way to train algorithms. Um, because, you know, like most of the foundation of deep learning have existed for more than 20 years, but we didn't know how to make it work before uh, for partially at least a reason of scale. And so, yeah, what we see now is you have like recent like GPT model, like GPT one, two, and three in the most recent one. You have like Dali, uh, who is using GPT three that has, you know, like from text can generate very realistically looking uh, images, at least in some domains. Uh, those are famous models of literally billions of parameters. I expect we continue to see that more and more, uh, more impressive results. But I also think that as impressive those results are, I think it's gonna take some time before we can really leverage those models for everyday improvements in many products. Uh, Cause I think it will require some UX changes. Um, and I think some domains will be transformed earlier than others. So while I think it's important to look at those like fancy models, I actually don't think that's where most of the value will be like leverage in the short term. Um, actually, the other trend I think is the most interesting one for most people, which is that it's going to be more easier and easier for non-ML engineers to apply machine learning to the specific domains. Uh, there's something I really like from like the fast AI organization where they say uh, making neural networks uncool again. And I think for most companies in the short to midterm, this is where I expect most value to come from. Like domain experts, non AI domain, but domain experts in industry. Actually, some of the panelists gave like really good examples of where you can use AI in things that most people are not aware of. Um, yeah, like you don't have to be an expert in AI, you have the domain expertise. And because AI is easier and easier to use uh, through open source, so like open source models, but also like um, more democratized practices, uh, I think that is really, really help. However, I think this transition will not be easy for everyone just because the methods are available and people can use, apply it easily. I think the companies which are used to be data driven and already invested in storing democratizing data are the ones that will be best positioned to use this. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that the companies today that are famous to use AI, like Fang, etc. Um, there were the first companies to be very data driven before, and now they are famous to use AI very well for their business. Uh, and I think they've been able to do that because they were data driven first. And uh, because I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that companies can do is to try to apply AI first without having experience leveraging data at a certain scale. This is maybe the mistake number one I've seen in many companies uh, that generally fails and creates a lot of confusion, frustration, costs a lot of money. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think companies will be able to leverage those like trends uh, needs first to think hard about like, are they able to use those methods effectively? And I don't think it's just a question of skills. It's also a question of maturity uh, of, of the company, especially on the data side. Interesting. Uh, thank you, David, for sharing this. Uh, let me now quickly check if our audience has also shared any questions. Uh, okay, so we have received uh, several interesting questions from our audience. Let me speak a few questions, which will be open to all the panel members here. Uh, the first question which we have received is, uh, 
how difficult it is for business leaders to make a business use case. Businesses use AI in their day-to-day -day operations when they are used to older ways of working. I mean, share their thoughts on how they confront them strategically, purposefully, and thoughtfully. Uh, let me know if you want me to repeat this question. Our audience wants to understand that for our business leaders today, how difficult is it to make the business use of AI in their day-to-day -day operations, given they are already used to leverage the traditional methods of working. Like uh, this was somewhat, I believe, similar to the question which I asked uh, Tori San as well, that even after implementing AI, we see personal judgment overtaking the AI-based decision making. Yes, I mean, may, may I? I please, please. Yeah, may, uh, may not be you know, the, the directly responding to the question is the one thing I want also I want to highlight here is you know, let's say you know, pick up the how say the sort of idea from the you know, sales distribution or sales you know, the allocation perspective. In general, maybe you know, usually people say that twenty percent of your product covers eighty percent of your sales. Let's say the thirty percent, and if it doesn't matter, you know, you know, uh, maybe service doesn't matter. Maybe the eighty percent first model only covers twenty percent, fifty percent. So if that's the case, why don't you use AI to cover that, you know, the eighty percent of the model? You know, so let human being take care of the you know, twenty percent, which covers eighty percent of yourself. Then let AI covers eighty percent, eighty percent model. Which covers twenty percent of the sales. Because if even though AI doesn't work well, your business impact is pretty much limited. You know, so maybe that, that might be a good, you know, one idea. How? Uh, so, so my my point is, you no, know, don't don't try to let AI cover everything. You know, what domain, what part, what you know, the sales model or model should be covered by AI to start with. So again, as I mentioned, we don't have any perfect answer to cover every single business operation, company operation. So let's pick up the right, right an appropriate one, which might not impact the business, you know, the model and operational model uh, of your company. So that's uh, kind of my view uh, on that. Is that okay, Mahit? Thank you, Tori san uh, for sharing this. Uh, any of our other panel members want to add anything uh, to what Tori san said? Uh, yeah, I think Toriyama san answer gives a very important point that I've seen myself over and over is a lot of people expect AI to be like human accurate. And in some domain, we've reached a point where we can, but in many domains, we can't. And generally, it's better to focus on covering most of the use case to optimize uh, like, um, like a process that still have human in the loop, so to speak. Uh, people who try to automate everything generally fail, at least in my experience. Uh, something I will add is if you start in a company that is not so used to be data-driven and metric-driven, is to figure out how your AI can affect some things that the business cares about. Um, so, you know, if it's, you know, if it's number of sales, if it's number of failures, it's number of faults, like whatever is really important to a key person in the company and to figure out like what you can do with AI, whether you can do something with AI or not, because sometimes it's not possible. Uh, starting from there generally is the best because what I see often is people coming from an AI background, they will think in terms of accuracy, you know, uh, like, um, you know, like very technical, like metric, which are important to make sure the AI actually works. But for a lot of people, that doesn't really talk to them, right? So you want to be able to link what your AI optimized to something the business stakeholders care about. And sometimes that's actually one of the main challenge. Uh, and that's why being data driven is so important in many such domains because you need to look at data first to understand how those two can be related. So yeah, and this is not actually sp that specific to AI. You always want to be able to affect some things that the business cares about, right? But I think for AI, it's even more important. Uh, I would say there's a number of reason. Number one reason I've seen AI failed in many companies I've worked at or consulted for in the past is because they didn't try to do that. Interesting. 
Uh, thank you, David, uh, for sharing this perspective. Another question that we have received from our audience is uh, they want to understand are there any successful cases of metabolic syndrome diagnosis in the healthcare field as it is applied to smart diagnosis? Uh, let me repeat this question. Uh, our audience members, all of them, want to understand about any successful cases of metabolic syndrome diagnosis in the healthcare field. Uh, would any of our panel members have any perspective on this? All right. Uh, so, Pipi, let us circle back to you, Ikosan, here. We will, uh, we will reply to you one on one to address this query. One more question that we have received from our audience is even though the demand for AI is growing, but the implementation maturity varies across enterprises. According to you, what are the challenges that enterprises are facing today to implement AI? I know, uh, David, and you, Son, you touched upon that uh, while we were having the discussion earlier. But uh, any one of you want to add more perspectives to it? this question in terms of the challenges that enterprises are struggling with to implement AI? Please, okay. Uh, please, uh, please. Uh, okay. Well, uh... I'm a, uh, well, my field is a, a plant industry, so let me talk about uh, the plant industry. Uh, yes. Um, when, you know, uh, they want to apply the AI on um, enterprise level or plant level, as, as I say, um, the most important thing is safety. Okay. So, uh, you know, if plants, uh, gets a wrong, you know, direction or something, then the, the plant might explode or something like that. Very dangerous thing. So uh, for the plant world, how to ensure the safety uh, of the directions from AI is the most important thing to consider. And the challenges, of course. Interesting. Um, thank you, Rio San, for this thing. Uh, so before we conclude today's session, I would also like to share my two cents on the future of AI. Uh, AI has made, made major strides towards replicating the efficiency of human intelligence in executing several activities and processes. There is no longer a debate of AI's increasing significance to business processes and strategy. We believe that over the coming years, applications and machines will become less artificial and more intelligent they will rely less on bottom-up large data sets, but more on top-down reasoning that more closely resembles the way humans approach problems. Uh, in fact, our esteemed panel members also touched upon this. I believe that AI will continue to augment and support humans. Uh, for future, what we mean that AI should be sustainable and the future of AI is going to be everywhere as we are on the process to unlock the potential of mind plus machine. I would like to thank all our esteemed panel members, my colleagues, and our wonderful audience for joining us today. I wish everybody a great day and week ahead. This brings us to the conclusion of our webinar on the future of AI. In case any one of our audience panel members have any queries, I request them to drop us a line at info at Thank you.